This episode is part two of a two part series. On the afternoon of January 16th, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia sits poised on launch pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center as the minutes tick down to liftoff. Columbia, with her crew of seven, has been selected for STS-107, a mission dedicated to scientific discovery with a focus on microgravity. The orbiter Columbia is the most iconic component of perhaps the most complex machine ever built, the Space Transportation System. The system consists of three main components, the orbiter itself, with its main engines mounted on its tail, the characteristic orange external fuel tank, and two solid rocket boosters. The numbers associated with the space shuttle are staggering. Two and a half million parts, 230 miles of cabling, 1,060 valves, 1,440 circuit breakers. The combined weight of Columbia as she sits fully fueled on launch pad 39A, is just over 2,000 tonnes. All of these components have been painstakingly assembled into what is known as the shuttle stack. The two solid rocket boosters are placed on top of a mobile launch platform, acting as the legs upon which the rest of the assembly will sit. The external tank, sitting between the two solid rocket boosters, is added next, acting as the backbone. Finally, the orbiter Columbia herself is attached to the external tank. She is attached at three points, two near the bottom of the tank and a bipod arrangement near the orbiter's nose. Once the entire assembly is ready, a crawler transport picks up the entire mobile launch platform and moves it at one mile per hour to one of two launch pads. At T-30 seconds, Columbia's internal computers take over the countdown, running through a myriad of system checks as the seconds count down. At T-16 seconds, the sound suppression water system is armed. Flowing at a rate of 3.5 million litres a minute, the water cushions the shuttle and the launch structure from the vibrations caused by the combined power of Columbia's engines and the solid rocket boosters. Nozzle check of the SRBs. Firing chain is armed. Now suppression water system armed. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. As we now know, 82 seconds later, Columbia is fatally struck by a piece of foam from the external tank, which causes catastrophic damage to the thermal protection system and leads to its destruction 16 days later. Part 2 tells the story of how the seven astronauts of STS-107 came to be placed in this situation. You are listening to Inside the Black Box. These are the events of Shuttle Transportation System Mission 107. Pull up! Pull up! To quote the Columbia Accident Investigation Board's report, the board's investigation of what caused the Columbia accident began in the fields of East Texas, where the wreckage of Columbia was found, but reached more than 30 years into the past. To understand the loss of Columbia fully, 
we need to start at the very beginning and chart the series of economically and politically driven decisions that would have fatal implications even decades later. The Space Shuttle program dates back to discussions that were taking place as man was taking its first steps on the moon, during the Apollo program. Once the program was completed, NASA wished to focus on developing increasingly larger human outposts in Earth orbit. These would be launched atop the famous rocket which carried Apollo's astronauts into space, the Saturn V. NASA wished to first construct a 12-person space station by 1975, followed by a 50 and then a 100-person station. Further installations would be placed in orbit around the moon, then constructed on the surface of the moon itself. In parallel to these aims, NASA would develop a vehicle suitable for the manned exploration of Mars. In order to achieve both of these visions, NASA required a vehicle which could transport personnel and supplies from Earth to low Earth orbit in as economical a way as possible. To minimise costs, a fully reusable vehicle was envisaged, and it was in this context that the concept of the space shuttle was born. While NASA's plans for the further exploration of space were visionary, these were in stark contrast with the political and economic realities of the United States during the late 1960s and early 1970s. President Johnson prioritised programmes designed to alleviate poverty and racial inequality in the United States, as well as managing the turmoil associated with the Vietnam War. Johnson was replaced by Nixon in 1969, who had no desire to enter into another large and expensive Apollo-style program, which at one point had cost the equivalent of 2.5% of the nation's entire gross domestic product. These budget cuts necessitated halting production of any further Saturn V rockets, which made NASA's vision of launching progressively larger space stations into orbit an impossibility. Missions to Mars would also need to be deferred. Within its budgetary constraints, the only program which NASA could hope to fund successfully was the lower-cost space shuttle, but the agency would still need to convince the White House Office of Management and Budget of the value of the project before it could be approved, and without the envisaged space stations to supply, what would its purpose be? NASA needed to create a new mission for the vehicle. NASA decided to justify the sanctioning of the space shuttle on economic grounds. The agency reasoned that if a single vehicle could launch all government, military and private sector payloads, and that vehicle could be reused, then the nation's cost of launching and maintaining satellites in orbit could be dramatically reduced. However, this argument only stacked up if the Department of Defence, who would be a key customer, was willing to use the shuttle to place its payloads in orbit. 50 launches per year would be required in order to justify investment in the program. In order to accomplish what NASA was promising, the vehicle it was required to design needed to be revolutionary. The vehicle would be the first reusable spacecraft, the first spacecraft with wings, and the first with a fully reusable system to protect it from the heat of re-entry. In addition, NASA had to meet the requirements of its key customer, the Department of Defence. At the height of the Cold War, the Department of Defence wanted the shuttle to be able to take off and land in a single polar orbit of the Earth. The intention was that in the event of an escalation of conflict with the Soviet Union, the shuttle could quickly be launched from the west coast of the United States, travelling south, deploy whatever equipment was required, then immediately deorbit and land at the same base it had taken off from. However, the requirement to land at the same location it had taken off from posed enormous design challenges. While the shuttle was travelling around the Earth, the planet would still be rotating below it 
This meant that the shuttle needed to travel east by about 1,100 miles to reach the same location it had launched from. This design consideration could only be met by installing large wings on the vehicle. The rate at which the orbiter would need to re-enter the atmosphere to land within a single orbit also required far more robust protection from the heat of re-entry than it would have otherwise required. These mounting requirements were in the context of the Office of Management and Budget stipulation that NASA's budget be kept low. NASA had originally envisaged a two-stage, fully reusable design. This involved a very large manned booster, which would carry a smaller winged manned orbiter. The booster vehicle would lift the orbiter to a certain altitude and speed, then separate. The booster would return and land horizontally, while the orbiter continued into low Earth orbit. After completing its mission, the winged orbiter would re-enter and land horizontally on a runway, like a conventional aircraft. Unfortunately, the incredible cost and complexity of such a system would need to be abandoned in recognition of the agency's budget constraints. In order to secure its own survival, which was not necessarily guaranteed, NASA had made bold claims about the space shuttle and the expected savings to be derived from it. In January 1972, those who had fought for the space shuttle program were successful. The program was approved. In the end, it had not been the economic cost and benefit analysis that had convinced President Nixon, but rather the political benefits by increased employment in important election swing states and initiating a new aerospace program in the crucially important 1972 election year. One final argument was crucial. NASA Administrator James Fletcher wrote to Nixon, stating that for the US not to be in space, what others do have men in space, was unthinkable, and a position which America could not accept. President Nixon declared to the American public that the shuttle would be designed to help transform the space frontier of the 1970s into familiar territory, easily accessible for human endeavour in the 1980s and 90s. The system would centre on a space vehicle that can shuttle repeatedly from Earth to orbit and back. It would revolutionise transportation into near space by routinizing it. NASA had a $5.5 billion ceiling to develop the shuttle. This was in comparison to the Apollo program, which had ended up costing nearly $25 billion by 1973. With this limit imposed on it, the development program started to make trade-offs which would keep development costs low initially. Unfortunately, the decisions made to keep development cheap would ultimately lead to higher operational costs and greater risks than had been promised. The shuttle had first been envisaged as holding its own liquid fuel tank, but in order to meet government payload requirements, it was decided to use a disposable external tank instead, increasing operating costs. The boosters, mounted on the side of the shuttle, were another area of compromise. While a liquid-fueled booster design provided better performance, lower per-flight costs, less environmental impact, and less developmental risk, solid boosters were seen as requiring less initial funding to develop, even though they were more dangerous than their liquid counterparts. The competing obligations of meeting Department of Defense requirements and developing a vehicle with low development costs led NASA to create a solution that attempted to be all things to all parties and ended up being none of them. Nevertheless, in spite of these pressures, NASA did develop a vehicle which met with their internal design requirements. The final design which was selected was a winged orbiter with three liquid-fueled engines, a large expendable external tank which held liquid propellant for these engines, and two reusable solid rocket boosters. Development of the Space Shuttle program 
proceeded during the 1970s. Its construction made extensive use of ground testing and computer simulation rather than early philosophies of actual flight testing used by the agency. While advances in simulation and modelling did make this method possible, it was undoubtedly also done as a cost-saving measure. The first time the space shuttle would be flown in space, it would have crew aboard it. That flight was scheduled for March 1978. Unfortunately, the groundbreaking technologies that were required for the development of the space shuttle meant that the schedule began to slip, first to 1979, then to 1980, and finally to the spring of 1981. In light of the delays and associated cost overruns, President Jimmy Carter's administration undertook a review of the program in 1979. Ultimately, this review did reaffirm the need for the space shuttle, particularly to enforce a recently executed arms control treaty by deploying the necessary satellites. While there were a number of other orbiters in construction, only one would be ready to launch in spring 1981. Named after the female personification of the United States, the space shuttle Columbia. On April 12, 1981, STS, or Shuttle Transportation System, Mission 1, lifted off from Kennedy Space Center, carrying two astronauts. They stayed in orbit for two days, before deorbiting and landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Over the next 15 months, Columbia was launched three more times, at the conclusion of the fourth mission, landing on July 4, 1982, President Ronald Reagan declared to the American public on Independence Day that the space shuttle was fully operational. And pushing back new frontiers, the fourth landing of the Columbia is the historical equivalent to the driving of the Golden Spike, which completed the first transcontinental railroad. It marks, it marks the, our entrance into a new era. The test flights are over. The groundwork has been laid. And now we will move forward to capitalize on the tremendous potential offered by the ultimate frontier of space. Beginning with the next flight, the Columbia and her sister ships will be fully operational, ready to provide economical and routine access to space for scientific exploration commercial ventures, and for tasks related to the national security. Simultaneously, we must look aggressively to the future by demonstrating the potential of the shuttle and establishing a more permanent presence in space. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board cited two principal reasons for the speedy declaration of the space shuttle as being operational. The first was NASA's hope of gaining swift presidential approval for its ultimate aim, the space station, which could not be undertaken while the shuttle was still considered a developmental vehicle. The second was the space shuttle now had a competitor for its commercial contracts, the European Space Agency had developed and launched a disposable launch system, the Ariane, which was now a viable competitor. From 1982 onwards, the Space Shuttle demonstrated its capabilities. It retrieved two communication satellites that had suffered upper-stage misfires after launch, repaired another communication satellite while in orbit, and flew multiple science missions with the pressurised European Space Lab module in the payload bay, which allowed astronauts to work in this environment. The shuttle took astronauts into space from a variety of countries, including Germany, Mexico, Canada and France. By 1985, there were four orbiters in operation. Nine missions were flown in a single year. By the end of 1985, 
the shuttle had launched 24 communication satellites and had an additional backlog of 44 orders for future commercial missions. But while the space shuttle program appeared to be proceeding as planned, it was in fact encountering numerous problems. When the shuttle had been designed, it was envisaged that the orbiter would be ready to launch within two weeks of landing. But in reality, this process would take months. It was discovered that far more maintenance was required on the orbiters between flights, before they could be launched. In 1975, it was projected that the orbiters would need ten working days to be turned around and ready for flight again. In 1985, an average of 67 days elapsed before the shuttle was ready for another launch. Despite its status as fully operational, the reality was that NASA engineers and their contractors were still learning a great deal about the capabilities and limitations of the space shuttle, trying to make necessary modifications while still ramping up the flight schedule. Half of the turnaround time after a mission was unplanned tests and modifications based on unexpected events that had occurred during flight. In addition, because there were very few redundant safety systems in the space shuttle, components needed to function perfectly every time. While NASA had planned for 50 launches per year, it was now targeting 24 launches per year by 1989. The per-mission cost for the space shuttle was now $140 million, which, adjusted for inflation, was seven times what NASA had originally predicted a decade earlier. But the push for a full flight schedule was having a more insidious and dangerous effect. Any illusion that the space shuttle was an operational system was shattered on the morning of January 28, 1986, On that day, the Space Shuttle Challenger was destroyed 73 seconds after launch. The seven-member crew, which included an elementary school teacher, were killed. To investigate what had happened to the Space Shuttle Challenger, a presidential commission was established, which became known as the Rogers Commission, after its chairman. The Rogers Commission concluded that the loss of Challenger was caused by a failure of the joint and seal between the two lower segments of the right solid rocket booster. Hot gases were able to blow past a rubber o-ring in this joint, leading to a structural failure and the explosion of the shuttle's hydrogen fuel. While the commission identified the failure of the SRB joint and seal as the physical cause, it also noted a number of NASA management failures which had contributed to the catastrophe. The Commission concluded that NASA's decision to launch the Challenger was flawed. Communication failures, incomplete and misleading information, and poor management judgments were all factors of the decision-making process that had permitted internal flight safety problems to bypass key shuttle managers. If those making the launch decision had known all of the facts, it is highly unlikely that they would have decided to launch Challenger on that day. Another key issue identified was the shuttle's increasing flight rates in the 1980s, which created schedule pressure, including the compression of training schedules, a shortage of spare parts, and focusing of resources on resolving short-term problems. The Rogers Commission concluded that the drive to declare the space shuttle operational had put huge pressures on NASA and stretched the agency past its limit. As well as mandating the redesign of the solid rocket booster, the Commission recommended the creation of an independent safety body within NASA, which would report directly to the NASA administrator. NASA took the Roger Commission's findings very seriously and made a great deal of organisational changes. The agency moved the management of the Space Shuttle program from the Johnson Space Center in Texas to NASA's headquarters in Washington, D.C. This was intended to prevent the sort of communication breakdown which had led to the Challenger disaster 
NASA also established the Office of Safety, Reliability and Quality Assurance, reporting directly to the NASA Administrator. While the Challenger disaster led to changes within NASA, it also resulted in governmental policy changes. The Challenger disaster destroyed the notion that the shuttle could make flying to space routine, and the United States would not risk its astronauts for commercial purposes. In addition, for government and military contracts, the shuttle could now only be used to launch payloads where a human presence was actually required. For all other launches, an expendable launch vehicle would be used. The planned shuttle facility to be used by the military at Vandenberg Air Force Base on the west coast of the United States was abandoned. 32 months after the loss of Challenger, the next space shuttle would launch. NASA would take this opportunity to construct a new orbiter to replace Challenger, the space shuttle Endeavour and undertake a number of upgrades on the existing space shuttles. As the shuttle returned to flight, the NASA Associate Administrator for Spaceflight stated, We will always have to treat the space shuttle like an R&D test program, even many years into the future. I don't think calling it operational fooled anybody within the program. It was a signal to the public that shouldn't have been sent. While NASA did undergo major organizational reforms following the loss of Challenger, including the appointment of new directors at Johnson, Marshall, and Kennedy Space Centers, the culture of the NASA human spaceflight program proved more difficult to change. NASA's organizational culture had been born in the hottest part of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. It had been created as a direct response to the Soviet launch of Sputnik 1, the first satellite in space. In 1961, President Kennedy tasked the fledgling agency with reaching the moon before the end of the decade, despite only having accumulated 15 minutes of spaceflight by this time. With its efforts linked to US-Soviet competition, there was a sense within the workforce at NASA that the agency was engaged in a historic struggle with a foreign power that was central to the entire nation's agenda. The Apollo program which would be established to accomplish President Kennedy's vision had a can-do attitude, marked by tenacity in the face of impossible challenges. This culture valued interaction between research and testing, hands-on engineering experience, and relied on the quality of its personnel. Importantly, this culture accepted risk and failure as inevitable aspects of operating in space, even as it held attention to detail in order to lower those chances of failure as its highest value. With the successful moon landing in July of 1969, and further achievements that would follow, it placed NASA in the national consciousness But these achievements also help reinforce NASA personnel's faith in their organizational culture. Its successes created an image of NASA as a perfect place, the best organization that humans could create to achieve selected goals. But the continuing image of NASA as a perfect place in the years after Apollo left current NASA employees and the employees that followed them unable to recognize that NASA had never been a perfect place. With the space race all but won against the Soviet Union, it was also significantly less important to the nation as a symbol of national pride. The pioneering and risk-taking culture that was encouraged, and to a certain extent may have been necessary during the Apollo program, would run into the more bureaucratic nature of the 1970s, Personnel were no longer being asked to design exploratory spacecraft, but instead to design a reusable vehicle to make getting into space and returning routine. What was effectively a space truck, as it was called at the time. The bottomless budgets of the 1960s had been replaced with an ever-tightening budget. A greater reliance on contractors to deliver the shuttle and a tendency towards bureaucracy 
required better communication in order for the agency to remain successful. But the Rogers Commission would find out following Challenger that this ability to effectively communicate was lacking. When criticism of the organization's culture was levelled against it, NASA would double down on it, exuding a self-confidence about the organization possessing unique knowledge on how to safely launch people into space that nobody else could do. In the aftermath of the Challenger disaster, this culture prompted a resistance to externally imposed changes and an attempt to maintain the internal belief that NASA was still a perfect place, alone in its ability to execute a program of human spaceflight. Within NASA centers, as human spaceflight program directors strove to maintain their view of the organization, they lost their ability to accept criticism, leading them to reject the recommendation of many boards and papers, including the Rogers Commission. This would become evident in how the organization handled decisions later. A strong indication of the priority which a nation's government places on an activity is the budget which is assigned to it. With this taken into account, NASA had not been a high priority for a number of decades by the time of the Columbia disaster. At its peak during the Apollo program, total NASA spending had been 4% of the federal budget. However, since the 1970s, NASA's budget had fallen to only 1% of the federal budget, or less. Faced with an ever-decreasing budget, NASA faced the choice of either eliminating major programs or achieving greater efficiencies while maintaining the existing agenda. As we shall see, the agency's leadership chose the latter. NASA's flat budget particularly affected the human spaceflight program. Beginning in 1993, the Space Shuttle would need to compete for funding with the International Space Station, a collaborative project between NASA and four other space agencies. This competing priority led the budget allocated to the Space Shuttle to begin to fall. Improvements on the shuttle, which NASA wished to carry out, were deferred in order to meet International Space Station targets. In 1994, the Office of Management and Budget insisted that any cost overruns on the International Space Station must be absorbed within the budget for human spaceflight. It could not be absorbed by other elements of NASA given the shuttle was the only other major project in the human spaceflight budget, the cost overrun of the ISS had a direct impact on what could be spent on the shuttle. This budgetary squeeze came at a time when the space shuttle program exhibited a trait which was common to most engineering systems. Increased costs due to greater maintenance requirements, declining contractor support, and deteriorating infrastructure. Maintaining the space shuttle was becoming more expensive at a time when funding was already stretched and was about to be stretched further. Not only was the space shuttle facing budgetary challenges in isolation, the 1990s were also a turbulent period for the agency. In 1992, the White House replaced the NASA administrator with Daniel S. Golden. This man was a self-proclaimed agent of change. Golden saw space exploration, both crewed and uncrewed, as NASA's principal purpose, with Mars its ultimate destination. Golden would unleash a torrent of changes. He was a proponent of the business management ideas of William Deming, who championed a number of techniques he had learned while working in Japan during the 1980s. This included promoting autonomy to operating units within the organization, and also the idea that checks and balances could be counterproductive. He believed that those carrying out the work should be directly responsible for the quality of their efforts. Golden's moniker during his tenure at NASA was faster, better, cheaper. He pushed for the use of robotic missions and downsizing the agency, 
which was perceived to have become bureaucratic and bloated. One of Golden's main priorities was decreasing the involvement of the NASA engineering workforce with the space shuttle program so that their skills could be freed up to finish the International Space Station and on what Golden believed to be the ultimate objective of NASA, travelling to Mars. This placed Golden at odds with the proponents of the shuttle, given its inability to leave low Earth orbit. With NASA leadership choosing to maintain its existing programs within a no-growth budget, management would need to find efficiencies within existing programs. Attempts were initially made to try and close one of NASA's three human spaceflight centers, but this met with strong resistance from the centers themselves and the contractors who serviced them. With the centers off-limits, this left the space shuttle, as NASA's largest budget item, as an obvious target. The space shuttle required a standing army of workers to keep it flying, so reducing the workforce's size was the primary means by which NASA leadership could lower its operating cost. These efforts began early in the 1990s and would continue throughout the decade. The first cuts to space shuttle funding were a direct response to what was perceived as the overreaction of the agency to the Challenger disaster. For example, the notion that many layers of safety inspections involved in preparing the shuttle for flight created a bloated and costly safety program. From 1991 to 1994, NASA cut shuttle operating costs by 21%. This translated to a 20% reduction in contractor personnel working on the shuttle and a 27% reduction in NASA personnel. Despite this significant cut, the shuttle was still projected to exceed its assigned budget by $2.5 billion. More cuts would be needed. Following a NASA functional workforce review, the agency once again cut personnel supporting the shuttle. By 1997, the number of NASA employees working on the space shuttle numbered 2,195, about half of what it had been five years earlier. The number of contractors was now 17,281. These staff cuts created uncertainty and tension within the shuttle workforce, as it would within any organization. To build on this, Some of the recommendations which had been made as a consequence of the Challenger disaster began to be reversed. Golden's view that headquarters should assign overall strategic objectives, with subordinates then delivering autonomously, was at direct odds with the Rogers Commission finding that shuttle operations should be managed from NASA's headquarters to facilitate communication. In 1996, Golden assigned Johnson Space Center as the lead center in the Space Shuttle program, just as it had been before the Challenger disaster. This now meant that managers at Johnson Space Center had authority over the funding and management of shuttle activities which took place at the other centers, Marshall and Kennedy. There was already a significant rivalry which had existed between the Marshall and Johnson Space Centers since the Apollo program. This situation did not alleviate this competition. The change did not go unchallenged. The head of the Space Shuttle program at NASA's headquarters in Washington, Brian O'Connor, was worried that the transfer of the management function back to the Johnson Space Center would return the shuttle program management back to the flawed organizational structure which was in place at the time of the Challenger disaster. Golden did give O'Connor the opportunity to challenge the decision a number of times, but was ultimately unconvinced, and the change continued as planned. O'Connor felt no choice but to resign. In 1996, Golden assigned a new director for the Johnson Space Center, his close advisor, George W.S. Abbey. Abbey was a career man at NASA and a veteran of the earlier missions of Apollo. He was a firm believer in the original human spaceflight culture, which centred on pushing boundaries and minimising, but accepting a degree of risk in these endeavours. In 
Abbey was an authoritarian figure in his role who would exert significant influence on the culture at Johnson Space Center for the rest of the 1990s. The mid-1990s were a time where the initiative of public-private partnerships were incredibly popular. These initiatives were seen across many federal programs, with the intended purpose being to import private sector efficiency techniques to make governments more results-oriented and less costly. NASA was no exception to this. In keeping with Golden's philosophy that NASA should focus on its core mission of research and development, Golden wished as much as possible to remove NASA employees from the operation of its various systems, which included the Space Shuttle. The idea of giving primary responsibility for Space Shuttle operations to a private enterprise was both in keeping with government priorities and matched Golden's own ideology. As a consequence, beginning in 1994, NASA began considering the feasibility of consolidating many of its space shuttle operations contracts under a single contractor. That same year, the space shuttle program was responsible for the management of 86 separate contracts, held by 56 separate contractors. It seemed common sense that consolidating these contracts would reduce redundant overhead both for NASA and its supplier base. The approach was recommended in what would become known as the Kraft Report, named after the head of the advisory committee which wrote it. The report made a number of recommendations which appeared to be at odds with the recommendations following the Challenger disaster of the shuttle being an experimental vehicle. The report found the following. 1. The shuttle had become a mature and reliable system, about as safe as today's technology will provide. 2. Given the maturity of the vehicle, a change to a new mode of management with considerably less NASA oversight was possible. 3. NASA should consolidate operations under a single business entity. 4. NASA should restructure and reduce the overall safety, reliability, and quality assurance elements, without reducing safety. The notion that NASA might even further reduce the number of employees working directly on the shuttle program prompted senior Kennedy Space Center engineer Jose Garcia to write to President Clinton in 1995. In the letter, he stated that the biggest threat to the safety of the crew since the Challenger disaster is presently underway at NASA. Historically, NASA had employed two engineering teams at Kennedy Space Center, one contractor and one government. The two teams would then cross-check each other's work and in this way help prevent errors. This technique was expensive, but it was also very effective. Despite these concerns, NASA leadership accepted the advice of the Kraft Report and in August 1995, began to solicit bids for the Shuttle Prime contract. In response to this request, Lockheed Martin and Rockwell, the two major Space Shuttle operations contractors, formed a new company, with each contractor holding a 50% share in the business, to compete for what was known as the Spaceflight Operations Contract. That new company would be known as the United Space Alliance. In November 1995, NASA awarded the Spaceflight Operations Contract to United Space Alliance on a sole source basis. No other organization was considered. United Space Alliance would be responsible for 61% of the shuttle operations contracts. Over 1996, NASA would negotiate the contract with United Space Alliance. The contract was designed to reward the company for performance successes and penalise failures. United Space Alliance would be required to meet a series of safety gates to ensure that safety remained a top priority. The contract also rewarded cost reductions which the organisation could achieve. NASA would take 65% of the savings and United Space Alliance the remaining 35%. 
the contracts would gradually be transferred from NASA ownership to United Space Alliance over a number of years, beginning with the major contracts. But to some, the spaceflight operations contract was not the final outcome, but only the beginning. Less than a year after the spaceflight operations contract was executed, United Space Alliance submitted a contractually required plan for completely privatizing the space shuttle. While this proposal was ultimately rejected, the idea of privatization lingered within NASA. A white paper was prepared by NASA for the White House, which stated that instead of splitting responsibilities between NASA and United Space Alliance, a single private entity could be created. This would involve the transfer of between 700 and 900 NASA employees to this new organization, including the mission controllers, program managers, and even the astronauts themselves. A final key issue which plagued the space shuttle was the question of when it would be replaced. National government policy alternately flipped between treating the space shuttle as one which was going out of business and anticipating a further two decades of use. As a consequence, there was limited and inconsistent investment on upgrading the vehicles and revitalizing the infrastructure required to support them. Between the Challenger and Columbia disasters, a number of prototypes were investigated as a suitable replacement for the shuttle. This included the National Aerospace Plane and the X-33 and X-34 projects. All projects ran into technical difficulties and never flew. In sum, NASA spent nearly 15 years and several billion dollars and failed to find a suitable replacement for the shuttle. What the projects did mean was uncertainty as to when the shuttle would actually be replaced. Between 1986 and the Columbia disaster, the replacement date changed from 2002 to 2006 to 2020. This shifting date complicated strategy on investment decisions to upgrade the shuttle. What this inevitably meant was that the upgrades were cancelled for fear of wasting the money. This ambiguity regarding the future of the space shuttle also led to issues with the maintenance of the space shuttle program's ground infrastructure, much of which dated back to Project Apollo, an early 1970s space shuttle program construction. Maintaining infrastructure was particularly difficult at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, which is constantly exposed to a saltwater environment. While the press photos would show gleaming white buildings, particularly the famous Vehicle Assembly Building, closer inspection would show that these were seriously deteriorating. In November 2001, Golden was replaced as NASA Administrator by Sean O'Keefe. O'Keefe had previously been the Deputy Director of the White House Office of Management and Budget, an organisation which NASA had frequently been in heated debate with regarding finances. O'Keefe's appointment was an explicit acknowledgement by the new Bush administration that NASA's main problems were not technical ability, but managerial and financial issues. O'Keefe's arrival coincided with a managerial realisation at NASA that spending reductions on the space shuttle had gone much too far, and a replacement was not on the horizon. In 2002, with this in mind, O'Keefe began to undertake a number of new policies to reverse the changes which had been made by Golden. Management of the Space Shuttle program was transferred back from Johnson Space Center to NASA headquarters in Washington. O'Keefe also introduced a Strategic Management of Human Capital initiative in order to ensure the quality of the future NASA workforce to address the skill shortage that now plagued the organization because of cuts. Finally, in November 2002, NASA made a fundamental change in its strategy in what was known as the Integrated Space Transportation Plan. NASA pulled funding from the Space Launch Initiative, which had been NASA's most recent attempt to design a replacement for the Space Shuttle. Instead, additional funds would be provided to the Space Shuttle program 
an international space station, with a commitment to keep the shuttle flying until at least 2010. To make good on this, NASA included $281 million in its 2004 budget submission to begin a space shuttle life extension program. But while these proposals would lead to upgrades to the shuttle in the longer term, in the immediate future, the damage was already done. The fiscal reality which the space shuttle had found itself in led to the system being poorly maintained and not upgraded, with a small workforce which had been repeatedly subject to layoff. Not only would financial issues plague the shuttle during the 1990s, but the schedule pressures, which many believed had played a role in the loss of the Challenger in 1986, began to return once again in the 1990s, this time under a different guise. During the 1990s, the International Space Station was the centerpiece of NASA's human spaceflight program. As discussed earlier, as the two main elements of the human spaceflight program, the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station were frequently in competition with each other for funding, and it would usually be the ISS which won. In November 1998, the first component of the ISS was launched from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the cargo block Zarya. By this time, the ISS was already two years behind schedule. The US launched its first ISS-related space shuttle mission a month later. A further four shuttle missions to the International Space Station took place in 1999 and 2000, readying the station for its first permanent crew, Expedition 1. They arrived at the station in late 2000. With the change in political leadership in the United States, from the Clinton to the Bush administration, the ISS was the subject of intense scrutiny. The space station was $4 billion over its projected budget and behind schedule. As a consequence, the scope of the International Space Station program was decreased to what would become known as the U.S. Core Complete Configuration. The Core Complete Configuration was a reduced design which could only accommodate three crew members. The final step in achieving this configuration would be the installation of Node 2, or the Harmony module. Harmony would serve as the utility hub of the ISS, connecting the laboratory modules of the United States, Europe, and Japan. Harmony would also provide electrical power and electronic data. Once Node 2 was attached, this would enable Europe and Japan to connect their laboratory modules. Launching Node 2, and thereby achieving core complete status, became an important and some would argue obsessive political and program priority for NASA. As a consequence of the ISS cost overrun, Golden, who was still at this time NASA administrator, chartered an International Space Station Management and Cost Evaluation Task Force. This team would assist NASA in identifying the reforms needed to bring the ISS program back under control. The first report, was deeply critical of NASA management of the ISS program, and by extension, the entire human spaceflight initiative. The task force also suggested that as a cost control measure, the space shuttle be limited to only four flights per year, and that NASA should revise the space station crew rotation period to six months. The cost savings from each of these could be used to offset cost overruns, NASA accepted the reduced flight rate recommendation. The Space Shuttle program believed that with the revised number of flights, Node 2 could be launched on February 19, 2004. In order to assess its performance in meeting these goals, a performance gate would be set in the autumn of 2003. If NASA's performance had been satisfactory in undertaking the ISS program, the resources assigned to the ISS would be reassessed and the scope of the station might once again be increased.
But in order for that to happen, NASA would need to demonstrate its program and fiscal responsibility and capability. The agency had effectively been put on probation by the White House and Congress. The agency would have to prove it could meet schedule within cost or risk having the ISS halted or core complete configuration only, a configuration far short of NASA's vision for the station. Upon first inspection, this date would not appear relevant to the Columbia disaster. After all, Columbia was not tasked with undertaking ISS-related missions, since she did not have the docking adapter required to connect to the station. However, as the Columbia Accident Investigation Board looked more closely at the NASA organization, it became clear that the complexity and political mandate surrounding the International Space Station, as well as the shuttle program's response, resulted in the pressure to meet an ambitious launch schedule, which Columbia was a part of. A schedule in itself is not a bad thing, and for large-scale organizations such as NASA, they are absolutely essential to help the organization manage their resources. Where problems arise is when the schedule must compete with other factors, including safety. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board wanted to know if there was undue pressure within NASA to meet the Node 2 launch date on February 19, 2004. When the board interviewed NASA staff, Senior management did not believe the core complete deadline placed pressure on the organization. However, the general workforce held the completely opposite view. The importance of the arbitrary date of February 19, 2004 was stressed from the very top of NASA. The Space Shuttle and Space Station program managers briefed the new NASA administrator, O'Keefe, on a monthly basis on the status of the program. A significant part of these briefings was spent discussing the Node 2 launch date. A screensaver was emailed to managers at NASA's Human Spaceflight Program, depicting a clock counting down to February 19, 2004, US core complete, to the second. At the time, NASA employees found this date amusing, because they did not believe it was a date which could realistically be met. Nevertheless, the engineers at NASA, with an almost clichéd can-do attitude, worked diligently to meet the core complete launch schedule. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, events began to eat away at the margin within that schedule. With the International Space Station relying on the Space Shuttle to deliver the required services, the Space Shuttle and ISS programs became intrinsically linked. Any problems with the planned schedule of one program reverberated through both. Previously, if one Space Shuttle mission had slipped, another could simply be brought forward to take its place. Now, the missions had to be flown in a specific order and were constrained by the availability of the launch pad the schedule of their Russian colleagues' Soyuz and Progress flights, and other processes. Any changes made to one mission would now impact all future launch dates. As the space station had grown, so had the complexity of the missions needed to complete the project. In July 2002, two major setbacks occurred. The first was technical issues which were discovered aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Small cracks had been found in the liquid hydrogen fuel lines of the Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-25 engines. STS-107, which would be flown by Columbia, was only four weeks away from launch at this time, but the problems found on Discovery caused the entire fleet to be grounded. The second problem related to maintenance on Discovery which was required. Because of this maintenance, Discovery would not be available for approximately 17 months. One month later, in August, the shuttle program realised it would be unable to meet the space station schedule with the available fleet. Columbia had never been outfitted to make a space station flight, so the other three shuttles, Endeavour, 
Atlantis, and Discovery had made these missions. But now, with Discovery out of action, all space station flights would need to be completed by only two shuttles, Atlantis and Endeavour. To alleviate this pressure, shuttle program managers elected to modify Columbia to enable it to fly to the space station. These modifications were meant to take place immediately after STS-107, so Columbia would be able to fly its first space station mission approximately eight months later. Columbia was therefore squarely in the path of U.S. core complete. STS-107 needed to launch on time and return so those modifications could begin, and the space station schedule not be interrupted. When shuttle operations resumed following the grounding of the fleet, the focus was on the launch of STS-112, 113 and 107, set for October, November and January respectively. Workers were uncomfortable with this rapid succession of flights, but again, worked to meet the deadlines. By December 2002, all available buffer had been lost. To try and catch up, staff were told to work throughout the Christmas holidays. A third shift of workers were hired and trained to support the shuttle fleet. The duration astronauts could stay in space was extended, past the recommended 180 days, and some tests, previously deemed as requirements, began to be skipped. Despite all of these efforts, the program managers still estimated that the launch of Node 2 would be one to two months late. They began to accept risks in trying to meet a schedule that realistically probably could never have been met. As we discussed earlier, NASA personnel are famed for having a legendary can-do attitude, working against the odds to achieve an outcome. While this can contribute to the agency's successes, it can also be disastrous. When workers were asked to find days of margin in the schedule, they would work furiously to do so and were praised for the additional days they could find. However, these same people had a problem admitting or advising management that a particular shortcut couldn't or shouldn't be done, or that resources were being stretched too thin. This tight schedule was the context in which NASA management and personnel would make decisions on STS-107 once it was in orbit. As we discussed earlier in the previous episode, foam loss and the risk it posed to the space shuttle was well understood, and the shuttle had never been designed to withstand any significant impact from foam loss. Next, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board wanted to understand how well understood the loss of foam was before the destruction of STS-107, and how much of a problem it had been historically. The investigation board would discover that foam loss had been a problem before the shuttle had even lifted off for the first time. When the Columbia Accident Investigation Board looked back at the data, from the beginning of the space shuttle program, foam loss from the external tank was considered a dangerous problem. Engineers were deeply concerned about the potential damage to the orbiter, and in particular, its thermal protection system. Parts of the thermal protection system are so fragile that a lightly pressed thumbnail will damage it. To address this, the shuttle's flight and ground system specification book specifically called out that foam loss was not permitted to occur. The assumption was therefore made when designing the thermal protection system that it would only be specified to withstand impacts from debris with a kinetic energy of less than 0.006 foot-pounds. In other words, the thermal protection system was designed with the assumption that foam loss would never occur. But despite this specification that the external tank should shed no debris, and that only very small tolerances for impacts would be designed into the thermal protection system, when Columbia launched for the first time, it was subjected to a significant number of hits from debris. More than 300 tiles on the thermal protection system needed to be replaced following the first mission. At the time, engineers stated that had they known the external tank would have produced so much debris, 
they would have found it difficult to clear Columbia for its maiden flight. But despite this high level of concern felt by NASA engineers about the foam strikes, foam continued to separate from the external tank. When it reviewed the data, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board found that orbiters would return to Earth with an average of 143 divots over the thermal protection system per mission. But with each successful return of the space shuttle, it appears that NASA engineers and managers increasingly regarded foam shedding and the subsequent damage it caused as inevitable and either as unlikely to jeopardize safety or as an acceptable risk. In addition, over time, the distinction between foam loss as a specific issue and debris from other sources appears to have become entangled. NASA and its contractors began to see the foam loss and debris events not as a safety of flight issue, but as a maintenance issue, to be expected on every flight. The problem began to be referred to, in NASA terminology, as in-family. This phrase refers to a problem that has been previously experienced, analysed and understood. The shuttle had never been designed to withstand any significant impact from foam loss. Nevertheless, despite frequent incidents and near misses, the space shuttle had been allowed to continue flying. The final bipod ramp foam loss before Columbia would occur on STS-112 in October 2002. 33 seconds after launch, when the space shuttle Atlantis was at 12,500 feet and travelling at Mach 0.75, ground tracking cameras observed an object fall from the external tank, which subsequently impacted not the orbiter itself, but the ring which attached the solid rocket booster to the external tank. After impacting the ring, The debris was observed to break into numerous pieces, which then fell along the solid rocket booster's exhaust plume. The debris impact was observed to cause a deep tear in the insulation which covered the attachment ring and also exposed the vulnerable material of the ring itself to the atmosphere. Given the loss of bipod foam on STS-112 had been significant, and given its proximity to the Columbia shuttle disaster, the board was very interested to understand NASA's rationale to continue flying. This decision was significant to what had happened to Columbia, because if NASA had treated the foam loss more seriously, it might have granted engineers requests for on-orbit imagery of damage to Columbia, or alternatively, cancelled STS-107 altogether until safety issues had been resolved. At the Program Requirements Control Board meeting, Following the return of STS-112, the Intercenter Photo Working Group, who are responsible for reviewing imagery of the shuttle during launch to identify any problems, recommended that the loss of bipod foam on STS-112 be classified as an in-flight anomaly. In a meeting chaired by Shuttle Program Manager Ron Dittermore, and attended by many of the managers who would be actively involved with STS-107, the Program Requirements Board ultimately decided against such a classification. Instead, after discussion with the Integration Office and the External Tank Project, the Chairman assigned an action to the External Tank Team. They would be responsible for determining the root cause of the foam loss and to propose corrective action. This approach was at odds with previous practice around foam loss, where the shedding had been designated as an in-flight anomaly. The external tank project was meant to report back on the 5th of December 2002, which was after the launch of the next space shuttle mission, STS-113, but before the scheduled launch of STS-107. In any event, the external tank project's timeline slipped, so that the report wouldn't be issued until after the launch of STS-107. NASA would launch not one, but two missions before the STS-112 foam loss was reported back on. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board wanted to understand why NASA would treat the foam loss on STS-112 differently to every foam loss that had occurred before it, that is, 
to stop treating the loss of foam from the left bipod ramp as an in-flight anomaly and allow two missions to fly before the external tank project would report back. There were two principal reasons for continuing with operations. The first was that space shuttle managers appear to have become conditioned not to regard foam loss or debris as a safety of flight concern. The second was the pressure being felt to continue flight operations to ensure that US Corps complete schedule was met. Even though the results of the external tank team's foam loss analysis had not been provided, the foam shedding was reported, or briefed, at STS-113's flight readiness review on October the 31st, 2002. Among the rationale given to continue flying after the foam strike was that the foam application was performed by experienced practitioners and that the application involved craftsmanship in the use of validated application processes. While these points are true, they did not reduce the risk of foam loss happening again, since no changes to that application process had been made. The briefing slide closed out with the statement that the loss of bipod ramp foam was no higher or lower than in previous flights. This statement could just as easily be rewritten to state that the probability of bipod ramp foam loss was just as high as it had been in previous launches. With no engineering analysis completed, the shuttle managers used the justification that past success was an indicator of future performance and made no change to the configuration of the external tank. The safety office also presented a report which estimated a 99% probability of foam not being shed from the bipod ramp even though no corrective action had been taken. This figure was based on the observed bipod ramp foam loss over 61 flights. While this percentage made the probability of foam loss appear very low, the calculation was done with a sleight of hand to make the probability of foam loss appear low, rather than actually trying to estimate the real likelihood. Firstly, the calculation equated the probability of foam being lost from the left and right bipod ramp when in reality, foam had never been shed from the right bipod ramp. This was a phenomenon that could not be explained by NASA. The calculation also miscounted the actual number of bipod foam loss events in two ways. First, the calculation only looked at flights between STS-112 and the most recent bipod foam loss event, it therefore excluded three other foam loss events which happened before this. The calculation also excluded the many flights where no imagery was available to determine if bipod foam loss had occurred, instead of projecting the statistical rate of bipod foam losses onto these missions. NASA management adopted an attitude of what you don't see won't hurt you, when the exact opposite was true. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board undertook the calculation again, including all missions for which imagery was available, extending the rate of foam loss for missions where imagery wasn't available, and adding the additional incidents which they had discovered. When this was done, the probability of foam loss was not 1 in 100, it was 1 in 10. The STS-113 Flight Readiness Review ultimately signed off the highlighted risk, agreeing that foam loss should be characterised as an accepted risk, rather than a safety of flight issue. Present at this meeting was an individual who would play an important role in the decisions made during STS-107, Linda Hamm. Linda Hamm would chair the STS-107 mission management teams, the meetings which oversaw Columbia's day-to-day -day operations once on orbit. STS-113 launched at night, so it is impossible to determine if foam loss was shed from the external tank, although it is a possibility. Ultimately, clearing STS-113 for flight would pave the way for the subsequent STS-107 with Columbia to take place. To show how minor the foam loss appeared to NASA, by the time the flight readiness review for STS-107 was undertaken,
The documents included no discussion of the still unresolved STS-112 foam loss, even though the external tank project's review had still not been completed. Now that the Accident Investigation Board knew why STS-107 had been permitted to fly, they wanted to look at the decisions made once Columbia was on orbit, and how the organisation had responded to the foam strike. The following is a summary of the actions, decisions and rationale which NASA used to permit STS-107's re-entry. The complex nature of NASA's organisation makes the topic challenging to explain, but understanding the decisions taken is vital to understand why the Shuttle Columbia was lost. STS-107 was launched on Thursday, January 16th, 2003, Flight Day 1. As with every shuttle mission, as soon as Space Shuttle Columbia had reached orbit on the morning of January 16th, NASA's Intercenter Photo Working Group at Marshall Space Center in Huntsville, Alabama, went to work. They began reviewing liftoff imagery by video and film cameras on the launch pad and at other sites around Kennedy Space Center. On the first review of the imagery, nothing unusual was noted. However, at 9.30 a.m. the following morning, Flight Day 2, on a second review, one of the working group noticed something unusual. About 82 seconds into the launch, something appeared to come loose from the external tank and strike the shuttle. Within an hour, other members of the Intercenter Photo Working Group at Kennedy also identified the strike on higher resolution film images that had just been developed. The images revealed that a large piece of debris from the left bipod area of the external tank had struck the Shuttle Columbia somewhere on its left wing. Since the resulting shower of post-impact debris could not be seen passing over the top of the wing, the analysts believed that the debris had impacted the left wing, below its leading edge. The working group were concerned about the size and speed of the debris, and searched for better views of the impact. NASA used 12 ground-based camera sites to track the progress of a shuttle launch for engineering analysis. Five of these sites are designed to track the shuttle from liftoff until it is out of view. On reviewing the imagery of these five sites, two did not capture the debris strike because of the angle of launch. Of the remaining three sites, the first had lost track of Columbia as it ascended into the atmosphere. The second was out of focus because of an improperly maintained lens. And the third site only captured a view of the upper side of Columbia's left wing. There was no higher quality view of the impact and potential damage to the orbiter available. Alarmed at seeing so severe an impact, and not having a clear view of the damage the strike may have caused, the Intercenter Photo Working Group members alerted senior program managers by phone and sent a digitized copy of the strike to hundreds of NASA personnel via email. So concerned were Intercenter Photo Working Group personnel that on the day they discovered the debris strike, they asked their chairman, Bob Page, to make a request to image the left wing with ground-based Department of Defense assets in anticipation of analysts needing these images to better determine potential damage. Bob Page contacted Wayne Hale at Kennedy Space Center to inform him of the debris strike and to request ground-based imagery of the orbiter in flight using military assets. Wayne Hale was the shuttle program manager for launch integration at Kennedy Space Center. Importantly for this story, Hale held a top-secret clearance and was familiar with the process of using military assets to attain images of the shuttle. Wayne Hale agreed to explore the possibility. Upon learning of the debris strike on Flight Day 2, the responsible system area manager from United Space Alliance, the private contractor we discussed earlier, and their NASA counterpart, formed a team to analyse the debris strike in accordance with mission rules requiring the careful examination 
of any out-of-family event. Using film from the Intercenter Photo Working Group, Boeing's Systems Integration Analysts prepared a preliminary study that afternoon. Their initial estimates of debris size and speed, origin of the debris, and point of impact would later prove remarkably accurate. Meanwhile, even though no report into the strike had yet been released, early opinions about potential damage to the shuttle's thermal protection system in general, and reinforced carbon-carbon leading edges in particular, had already begun to be circulated among technical managers. The subsystem area manager for the thermal protection system issued an email to other management, stating, Basically, the RCC is extremely resilient to impact-type damage. The piece of debris, most likely foam or ice, looked like it most likely impacted the wing leading edge reinforced carbon-carbon and broke apart. It didn't look like a big enough piece to pose any serious threat to the system, and Mike Gordon concurs. At T plus 81 seconds, the piece wouldn't have had enough energy to create a large impact to the reinforced carbon-carbon wing leading edge system. This opinion appeared to be shared with senior NASA management. Both NASA and United Space Alliance management had confirmed that contractor personnel would not be looking at the debris strike over the upcoming holiday weekend, given what they perceived to be the low speed of the impact and the robustness of the thermal protection system and the RCC panel. Towards the end of Flight Day 2, the Intercenter Photo Working Group distributed its initial report, which included digitized clips of the debris strike via email. This was sent throughout NASA and the contractor communities. Already, just one day after the launch, there was a significant difference in opinion between NASA management and the engineers with the technical knowledge of the situation. The Intercenter Photo Working Group were deeply concerned about the debris strike and wanted on-orbit images of the shuttle's left wing to deepen their analysis. They had initiated actions to achieve this. A debris assessment team had also been established to further understand the impact. In contrast, senior management at NASA and the United Space Alliance were voicing a much lower level of concern, and had actually stated that United Space Alliance and Boeing contractors should not work on analysing the debris strike over the weekend, since it wasn't necessary. Despite this instruction from management, technical personnel did work over the weekend. Boeing analysts performed a preliminary damage assessment on Saturday, Flight Day 3. Using videos and photographs, they generated two estimates of possible debris size. They determined that the debris was travelling at a speed of 750 feet per second, or 511 miles per hour, when it struck the orbiter with an angle of less than 20 degrees. This assessment was in sharp contrast to the earlier circulated email from management, stating that the foam wouldn't have had enough energy to damage the orbiter. The analysts also studied where the debris was likely to have struck the shuttle using a transport analysis model. This model identified 15 strike regions and the angles of impact with the shuttle. Twelve of these areas were on the shuttle's lower tiles, and only one was the shuttle's reinforced carbon-carbon leading edge. As a consequence, the analysts would now focus their attention on the tiles and not the RCC panels. With estimates of the size of the debris, its speed and location, the analysts now wish to understand what kind of damage the shuttle could have incurred. In order to achieve this, they used a mathematical modelling tool known as Crater, which had been specifically developed to predict the depth of thermal protection system tile which debris could penetrate. This algorithm had been previously used for estimating small debris impacts, such as foam ice and metal debris during testing, with the debris being about 3 cubic inches. When the model had previously been tested, 
crater usually predicted more severe damage than had actually been observed. This had led engineers to classify crater as a conservative tool, one that would predict more damage than might actually occur. Previously, crater had only been used to predict whether small debris would pose a threat to the orbiter during launch. The use of crater to assess the damage caused by foam during the launch of STS-107 was the first time the model had been used while a mission was taking place. Also, the model was being used to simulate a piece of debris that was 640 times larger than the model had been calibrated with. Given the transport analysis mostly predicted damage to the underside tiles of the orbiter, damage estimates mainly looked at the potential damage to the thermal protective tiles on the underside of Columbia. When it was first run, the crater model actually predicted damage deeper than the thickness of the shuttle's thermal protection system. This was an alarming result, and suggested that the debris which had struck Columbia was likely to have exposed the orbiter's fragile aluminium airframe to the extreme temperatures of re-entry. In spite of this, the team discounted Crater's findings for two reasons. First, the results of calibration tests with smaller projectiles showed that Crater's results were overly pessimistic. Secondly, the Crater model did not take into account the more robust outer layer which made up the structure of the thermal protection system tiles. Boeing and NASA engineers therefore judged the actual damage from the large piece of foam to be less severe than Crater was predicting. However, the engineers were aware that not all areas of the orbiter's thermal protection system behaved the same. Areas such as the seals around the orbiter's landing gear doors, for example, were particularly vulnerable to debris strikes. Determining the precise location of the impact was therefore crucial to undertake an accurate damage assessment. The engineers turned to potential damage suffered by the reinforced carbon-carbon panels on the wing leading edge. They used a model similar to Crater to determine the damage suffered. The only model available was from impact by small ice projectiles in 1984. But because the foam which had struck Columbia was less dense than ice, the severity of the impact under this model was intentionally reduced. The only scenario which predicted an impact on the RCC panel had the foam striking at 21 degrees. The angle that was predicted on the wing leading edge impact was greater than the threshold to penetrate the leading edge, so it was assumed that the foam could not have penetrated the panel. Because only one of the transport scenarios predicted a strike on the RCC panels, further analysis was not completed. With the initial analysis completed, the debris assessment team met the following Monday, which was flight day 5 for an informal discussion before the formal meeting scheduled for the next day. The main outcome of the meeting was a strong desire to get additional ground-based imagery of Columbia to determine exactly where the debris strike had occurred and refine their analysis. Given the Monday was a public holiday for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, little additional work was completed. The following day, Tuesday, Flight Day 6, the mission management team met to discuss the progress of STS-107. Linda Hamm acted as chairperson for the meeting. The transcript is the first record of an official discussion of the debris impact. In recognition of its importance, before the topic of the debris was reached, the mission management team discussed the orbiter being 75 kilos overweight a leaking water separator, a jammed camera, payload and experiment status, and a communications problem. Finally, the topic of debris was raised. The following is an audio recording from the actual mission management team meeting. Right, or maybe we could power up and, I don't know, fess some more and get rid of some water. I don't know. <laughs> 
We can see that Ham is not discussing the debris strike in the context of damage to the shuttle Columbia on orbit. She is effectively dismissing the safety concern by stating that there was nothing that could be done about the debris strike, even if it had occurred. Linda Ham wished to understand why STS-113, and by extension STS-107, had been permitted to fly after the debris strike which had taken place on STS-112, which we had discussed earlier. This was in spite of her being present at the meeting in October, where the rationale to continue flying had been presented to her, and approved. Following the meeting, the rationale to continue flying was sent to Linda Ham. As we discussed earlier, that rationale was that the loss of foam from the bipod was not a safety of flight issue for the shuttle, and this was the reason STS-113 had been permitted to fly, and by extension, STS-107. Ham's focus on examining the rationale for continuing to fly after previous foam strikes indicates that her attention had shifted from the immediate danger which the foam posed to the current mission to the downstream implications of the foam strike on future missions and in particular, meeting the Node 2 launch date for US Core Complete. If the shuttle program's rationale to continue flying with foam loss was found to be flawed, the next mission, STS-114, would need to be delayed. It was at this point that the momentum from decisions made in the past began to impact on the decisions made for STS-107. Having had a hand in the recently accepted rationale for STS-113, where foam strikes had been classified as not a safety of flight issue, this provided a strong incentive for managers and engineers now involved with STS-107 to maintain that justification. If managers and engineers were to argue that foam strikes were a safety of flight issue after all, they would contradict the established consensus of the mission before, which they themselves had played a part in building. Perhaps most tellingly, although Linda Ham did not disclose any misgivings in the mission management team meetings, she did forward the justification to her manager, Ron Dittermore, along with her own feelings regarding the justification to continue flying. The email states the following. You probably can't open the attachment but the external tank rationale for flight for the STS-112 loss of foam was lousy. The rationale states we haven't changed anything. We haven't experienced any safety of flight damage in 121 flights 
risk of loss of bipod ramp thermal protection system is the same as previous flights, so the external tank is safe to fly with no added risk. The rationale was lousy then, and still is. Meanwhile, responding to concerns from his employees who were participating in the debris assessment team, one United Space Alliance manager contacted their NASA colleague, Lambert Austin, to ask what it would take to get imagery of Columbia on orbit. Lambert in turn telephoned the Department of Defense Manned Spaceflight Support Office to ask what actions would be needed to get imagery of Columbia. Austin emphasized that this was merely information gathering at this stage. The Department of Defense began working on his request. Later on the same day, still flight day 6, the debris assessment team held its first formal meeting to finalize its damage estimates to Columbia and their potential consequences. After two hours of discussion, the conclusion was that the team needed to know precisely where the debris had impacted the orbiter. The team assigned the co-chair of the debris assessment team, Rodney Rocha, to pursue the request for imagery of Columbia on orbit. Normally, Rocha would work the request up through the usual chain of command, through first the mission evaluation room, and then the mission management team, chaired by Linda Hamm. However, on this occasion, the debris assessment team, largely because of a perceived lack of interest from the mission management team members, decided to pursue the request through another channel at the Engineering Directorate at Johnson Space Center. As a consequence, Rocha sent an email to his manager to make the request. On Wednesday, Flight Day 7, there had now been three separate requests for ground-based imagery of Columbia. The request by Bob Page of the Intercenter Photo Working Group to Wayne Hale, an informal request for information made by Lambert Austin to the Department of Defense, and a third, formal request made by Rodney Rocha, chairman of the debris assessment team, to his manager. A chain reaction of events would now occur, which would lead to all three requests being terminated. The first request was made the day after the launch, when the chairman of the Intercenter Photo Working Group, Bob Page, had contacted Shuttle Program Manager for Launch Integration, Wayne Hale. On Wednesday, Flight Day 7, he contacted a Department of Defense representative who worked at Kennedy Space Center and asked that the military start the planning process for imaging Columbia on orbit. Within an hour, the Department of Defense representative contacted U.S. Strategic Command at Colorado's Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Station and asked what would be required to get imagery of Columbia on orbit. Personnel at the station began working on the request. Because this request had been made without approval from the mission management team chair, Linda Hamm, Hale also began to make the request through official channels. In the meantime, Lambert Austin telephoned Hamm to inform her about the imagery requests which both he and Hale had made. Ninety minutes later, the NASA Department of Defense liaison contacted U.S. Strategic Command at Cheyenne Mountain Air Force Base and cancelled the request for imagery. NASA would no longer need the military's help. What had happened in those ninety minutes? While on the telephone to Linda Hamm, Lambert Austin admitted that he had made requests out with the chain of command, but he had been responding to his colleagues' concerns at the United Space Alliance who were involved with the debris assessment team. After finishing speaking with Austin, and even though she knew about the request for imagery, Ham telephoned a number of other members of the mission management team to determine the origin of the request and if there was a requirement for it. All of the mission management team members stated that there was no requirement for on-orbit imagery, or they were not aware of any requirement. As a consequence, Ham ordered that the request to the Department of Defense be cancelled. When Ham officially terminated the actions the Department of Defense had begun for imaging requests 
she not only terminated the Intercenter Photo Working Group's informal and unofficial request via Wayne Hale, she also terminated the official request which Rodney Rocha had made as the chairman of the debris assessment team. While Ham would later state that she did not know that the debris assessment team wanted imagery of Columbia on orbit, she never asked them if they had made a request. This was even though they were the team directly charged with analysing the foam strike. What is more, later on the same day, Linda Ham raised concerns that the extra time which would need to be spent manoeuvring Columbia to make the left wing visible for imaging would unduly impact the already tight mission schedule, stopping science experiments. Of course, as we have discussed earlier, this would probably affect the schedule for the construction of the International Space Station. Shuttle managers also believed that historical image resolution provided by the Department of Defence had been very poor. There is no way that anybody in the management team for STS-107 knew about the imaging capabilities available to the United States military, nor did anybody seek to understand what the capabilities actually were. Meanwhile, Linda Hamm continued to seek information on whether the foam strikes posed a safety of flight issue. These questions were not being asked in the context of STS-107 and Columbia in orbit, but as a general question. Linda Hamm asked her senior leadership if it was possible to say that the foam strike was not a safety of flight issue. Lambert Austin, who had been instrumental in making the initial imagery request, replied and stated that no, the foam loss did pose a safety of flight issue and it was impossible to preclude a catastrophic event from foam loss. Austin then did tie the initial open question back to STS-107, stating that unless the analysts knew exactly where the foam had struck the orbiter, it would be impossible to know the severity without also knowing the location of the impact. The email implies that there was a great deal of unknowns, and on-orbit imaging would greatly clarify the situation. Despite this, no further action was taken on this email. Later on launch day 7, the second debris assessment team meeting was held. At the meeting, those who had not heard the news about the image request being denied already were also told. What the team did not realise was that the denial wasn't necessarily a final response to their request. The rejection was only meant to stop the informal request with the caveat that unless there was a mandatory requirement for imaging raised through formal channels, no request could be fulfilled. The team discussed reasons as to why their request for imagery might have been denied, and whether any further analysis was worth undertaking without that imagery. The engineers tried to work out what a mandatory requirement was. Analysts on the debris assessment team were in the unenviable position of wanting images to more accurately assess damage, while simultaneously needing to prove to program managers, as a result of their assessment, that there was a need for images in the first place. In other words, the debris assessment team had to prove that the situation was unsafe before the mission management team would take any action, rather than proving it was safe. Eventually, the team concluded that they could not justify a mandatory requirement for additional imagery, and the request was dropped. However, despite the request for images being denied, the debris assessment team did continue to analyse the foam strike. The next day, on Thursday, Flight Day 8, it was decided to inform the astronauts about the foam strike. This decision was not taken to alert them of a potential problem, but rather to prepare them for any questions which might arise during an upcoming public press conference. One of the flight directors sent an email to Commander Rick Husband and Pilot Willie McCool, titled, For Attention Only, Possible Public Affairs Office Event Question. Rick and Willie you guys are doing a fantastic job staying on the timeline and accomplishing great science. 
Keep up the good work and let us know if there is anything that we can do better from a mission control center standpoint. There is one item that I would like to make you aware for the upcoming PAO event on Blue Flight Day 10 and for future PAO events later in the mission. This item is not even worth mentioning other than wanting to make sure that you are not surprised by it in a question from a reporter. During ascent at approximately 80 seconds, photo analysis shows that some debris from the area of the Y external tank bipod attach point came loose and subsequently impacted the orbiter left wing in the area of transition from chine to main wing, creating a shower of smaller particles. The impact appears to be totally on the lower surface and no particles are seen to traverse over the upper surface of the wing. Experts have reviewed the high-speed photography and there is no concern for RCC or tile damage. We have also seen this same phenomenon on several other flights and there is absolutely no concern for entry. That's all for now. It's a pleasure working with you every day. This email was followed a short time later with an attachment showing the debris impact. Commander Rick Husband acknowledged receiving the messages. The same day, a NASA representative sent an email to US Strategic Command, who had been asked for imagery, effectively telling them that there was nothing to worry about and they should not entertain unofficial requests for information from NASA employees. The email states, You've got mail. Let me assure you that, as of yesterday afternoon, the shuttle was in excellent shape, mission objectives were being performed, and that there was no major debris system problems identified. The request that you received was based on a piece of debris, most likely ice or insulation from the external tank, that came off shortly after launch and hit the underside of the vehicle. Even though this is not a common occurrence, it is something that has happened before and is not considered to be a major problem. The one problem that has been identified is the need for some additional coordination within NASA to ensure that when a request is made, it is done through the official channels. One of the primary purposes for this chain is to make sure that requests like this one does not slip through the system and spin the community up about potential problems that have not been fully vetted through the proper channels. Meanwhile, the debris assessment team, who had decided to continue their work despite the denial for ground-based imagery, met for a third time. The engineers noted that there was no alternate trajectory during re-entry which Columbia could fly to reduce the heating on the suspected area of the foam strike. Engineers also presented final debris trajectory data, which included three debris size estimates to cover the continuing uncertainty about debris size. In the face of the denial for the request for imagery, the team discussed whether to include a presentation slide supporting their desire for images of the potentially damaged area of the shuttle. Many still felt that this was a valid request and wanted their concerns to be raised at the upcoming mission evaluation room briefing, where the debris team's findings were to be presented. Eventually, the idea of including a presentation slide about the imaging request was dropped. Just prior to attending the debris assessment team presentation at the mission evaluation room meeting, the co-chair of the debris assessment team, Rodney Rocha, who had made the formal request for ground-based imagery, spoke to tile expert Calvin Schoenberg. Schoenberg had been the individual who had sent out the email to management hours after the foam strike had been reported, stating that the strike shouldn't be an issue. He had sent several emails since, stating that the repair would be a maintenance issue. During Rocha's conversation with Schoenberg, Schoenberg implied that the foam impact on Columbia was within the experience base and was only a maintenance issue. Rocha disagreed and argued about the potential for burn-through on re-entry. Calvin Schoenberg then said that if there was indeed severe damage to the tiles, nothing could be done. According to Boeing analysts who were members of the debris assessment team, 
Schomburg had challenged them about their rationale for pursuing the ground-based imagery. The Boeing analysts retorted that something the size of a large cooler had hit the orbiter travelling at 500 miles per hour. When asked for further reasoning, the analyst said that at least they would know what happened if something were to go terribly wrong. The next day, Flight Day 9, Boeing and United Space Alliance personnel presented the debris assessment team's findings to the Mission Evaluation Room manager. In a signal that engineers and mission personnel shared a high level of concern about Columbia's condition, there were so many people in the briefing room that it was standing room only, with people lining the hallway outside. The presentations included view graphs which discussed the debris assessment team's methodology and five scenarios for debris damage, each based on different estimates of debris size and impact point. Each case was presented with a general overview of the physics involved with the impact, results from the modelling undertaken using the crater tool, and predicted thermal and structural effects for Columbia's re-entry. The briefing primarily focused on damage to the tiles, not the RCC panels on the shuttle's leading edges. The presentation stressed that they had performed the analysis properly, but within the limitations of the information which they had available to them. They stressed the many uncertainties, including where the debris had actually struck the orbiter, and the fact that the crater tool was being used to study a much larger impact than it had been used for previously. Nevertheless, their analysis concluded that no safety of flight issue existed. Engineers who attended the briefing would later say that management personnel appeared to focus on the answer, that analysis had shown that no safety of flight issue existed, rather than looking at the engineers' concerns regarding the uncertainties which they believed may have undermined their analysis. The manager of the mission evaluation room, Don McCormick, took the outcome of the debris assessment team's findings to the mission management team meeting later in the day, chaired by Linda Hamm. Okay, anything else on the downweight? Okay, go ahead, Don. Okay. And also we've... Uh... We've received, uh, you know, the data from the systems integration guys of the uh, potential ranges of sizes and, and impact angles, and you know where it might have where it might have hit. And the guys have gone off and done an analysis. They've used um, they use a tool they they refer to as Crater, which is their official evaluation tool to determine the, the potential size of the uh, the damage. Um, so they they went off and and, uh, and done all that work, and they've done thermal analysis of the areas where they where there may be damaged tiles. Um, the analysis is not complete. There's one, one case yet that they, they wish to run, but kind of just jumping to the conclusion of all that. Um, the, um, they do show that, you know, obviously there's a potential for significant tile damage here, but, but they do not indicate that the thermal analysis does not indicate that there's a potential for a burn through. I mean, there could be localized heating damage. Um, you know, there's... Obviously, there's a lot of you know uncertainty in all this in terms of the size of the debris and where it hit and the angle of incidence and and um, so it's 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 and difficult. No burn through means no catastrophic right, damage. Right. And no, the localized heating damage would mean a tile replacement. It, it would mean possible impacts to turnaround repairs and that sort of thing. But but we do not see any kind of um, you know safety of flight issue here yet in, in anything that we've looked at. No safety flight, no issue for this mission, nothing that's going to do different. Right. And there may be a turnaround. Right. It potentially could have hit the RCC, and we don't indicate other than, you know, possibly coating damage or something. We don't see any, any issue if it had hit the uh, RCC. So, um, although we could, again, it's, although we could have some significant tile damage, it, we don't see a safety of flight what issue. What do you mean by that? Well, it could be down to the... Um, it, we could lose an entire tile, I mean, it, and then the ramp into and out of that. I mean, it could be a, a significant area of tile damage down to the SIP, perhaps. Um, so it, it could be a significant piece missing, but... Um, that would be a turnaround issue on Right. Okay, same thing that you told me about the other day. 
my office. You seen pieces of this size? Linda, and we can't hear the speaker. He's, uh, he was just uh, reiterating, it was Calvin, uh, that he doesn't believe that there is any um, burn through, so no a safety flight kind of issue. It's more of a turnaround issue similar to what we've had on other flights. Any, that's it? All right, any questions on that? The conversation was considered so minor that it was not even included within the minutes of the mission management team meeting. As far as the mission management team were concerned, this was the end of the matter. Later on in the day, it was noted in the mission evaluation room flight log that no safety of flight issue existed regarding the foam strike and the potential damage to the thermal protection system. Between flight day 10 and flight day 16, when Columbia was scheduled to re-enter the atmosphere, concern persisted amongst analysts and engineers, but with the conclusion by the debris assessment team that the impact posed no safety of flight issue, these engineers could do little else to justify their concerns. After the accident, program managers stated privately and publicly that if engineers had a safety of flight concern, they were obligated to communicate their concerns to management. Managers did not seem to understand that as leaders, they had a corresponding and perhaps even greater obligation to create viable routes for the engineers and analysts to express their views. This barrier to communications not only blocked the flow of information to managers, but it also prevented the downstream flow of information from managers to engineers, leaving debris assessment team members with no basis for understanding why their request for imagery had been rejected. While this episode has focused on NASA as an organisation, the decisions it would take would have very real human implications for the crew aboard STS-107. We will complete our analysis by discussing the fate of the seven astronauts of STS-107 on Columbia's final re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. It is 8.44am on flight day 16 of STS-107. The Space Shuttle Columbia has just reached entry interface, the point where the orbiter begins to experience Earth's atmosphere. The astronauts of STS-107 are clothed in their ACES, or Advanced Crew Escape Suits. The distinctive orange suit is fully pressurized when the helmet and gloves are fitted, and is designed to protect the crew from the depressurization of the crew module. The Space Shuttle crew module is the habitable area of the orbiter. There are two decks, an upper flight deck where the orbiter is controlled from, and the mid-deck where the crew eat, sleep, and live, with removable seats for launch and re-entry. On the flight deck, in the shuttle commander's seat on the left, is Rick Husband, a colonel in the US Air Force and a test pilot. STS-107 is Husband's second trip to space. Sitting in the right seat is pilot William Willie McCool, a commander in the US Navy and also a test pilot. Also sitting on the flight deck, immediately behind Husband and McCool, are two further astronauts. Mission specialists Kalpana Chola and Laurel Clark. Chola, sitting on the left, is the first woman of Indian descent to travel into space. Clark, who is sitting on the right, is currently holding a small digital camera and filming the progress of Columbia's re-entry. On the mid-deck of the crew module sits the final three astronauts which make up the flight crew of STS-107. In the leftmost seat is mission specialist Michael Anderson. Anderson is serving as STS-107's payload commander and is in charge of science experiments on the Columbia. The center seat is currently unoccupied, but will shortly be used by mission specialist David Brown. The crew of STS-107 have developed a close bond during their training 
and the mission itself, and Brown is preparing a video to commemorate the flight with his fellow astronauts. Finally, in the rightmost seat is payload specialist Ilan Ramon. Ramon is the first Israeli to travel into space. He has sought to follow Jewish observances while in orbit, and was the first spaceflight participant to request kosher food. He has reportedly sought advice from a rabbi about how to observe the Jewish Sabbath in space, as the period between sunrises in orbit is only 90 minutes. As Columbia begins to travel through the Earth's atmosphere, flashes of light are visible out of the orbiter's forward windows, caused by a build-up of plasma. Commander Husband asks the flight crew to carry out suit pressurization checks. This involves pulling the visor of the helmet down in order to seal the suit and pressurize it to ensure that there are no leaks. Once this is completed, the crew flip their visors back up again. Although it would appear to make sense to have the suits pressurized during re-entry, the pure oxygen provided by the suit would be vented into the crew compartment, enriching the atmosphere and increasing the likelihood of a fire in a pure oxygen environment. For this reason, re-entry is performed with helmet visors up and the suit unpressurized. To the astronauts aboard STS-107, the re-entry appears to be going exactly as planned. Five minutes after re-entry interface, at 8.49 and 32 seconds, Columbia begins her first S-turn, rolling to the right to manage her rate of descent towards Kennedy Space Center. However, unbeknownst to the astronauts and those at Mission Control, since entry interface, the superheated air of re-entry has been penetrating reinforced carbon-carbon panel 8 left. As this air enters the wing, it begins to first heat, then melt the fragile aluminium airframe of the orbiter's wing and deform it. The first effect is an increased tendency of Columbia to yaw to the left due to the excess drag being caused by the damage to the flight surfaces. At the same time, the lift generated by the wing begins to drop, causing Columbia to begin rolling to the left. Columbia's flight systems adjust the shuttle's left elevon to trim to compensate and produce the required lift to keep the orbiter level. This yawing and rolling tendency is gradual at first, and not noticed by either Commander Husband or Pilot McCool, nor by the team of mission controllers at Houston. The first indication of a problem on the ground comes from the failure of four hydraulic return temperature sensors at 8.53 and 10 seconds as their wiring is burnt through. This causes concern in mission control as they work to determine what could cause a simultaneous failure, but neither Commander Husband nor Pilot McCool had this data available to them on the flight systems and were not aware of any issue. At 8.53 and 26 seconds, Columbia passed over the Californian coast. Ten seconds later, the yawing tendency to the left, which had been steadily increasing, exceeded all previous flight experience. For spectators watching the re-entry of Columbia on the west coast of the United States, they can see bright specks coming off the orbiter as it streaks overhead. This was later determined to be small pieces of the left wing, becoming dislodged and falling from the shuttle. A minute later, by 8.54 and 26 seconds, Columbia has already reached the California-Nevada border. A significant piece of debris is seen to be dislodged from the shuttle's wing, perhaps weighing a few hundred kilos. At 8.56 and 30 seconds, Columbia begins to reverse its role as part of the second half of its S-turn, changing from a right-wing low attitude to a left-wing low attitude. It is at 8.58 that the situation begins to unravel. 
the left wing has now been severely damaged. The orbiter's tendency to roll and yaw to the left has been increasing gradually and was countered by the use of left elevon trim. Suddenly, as the wing's structure begins to fail, the yaw and roll to the left increases rapidly. The trim required to keep the orbiter on its desired trajectory increases to match. At 8.58 and 39 seconds, the crew of Columbia are made aware of a problem for the first time. A tone sounds, drawing the flight crew's attention to the backup flight software monitor. The fault message indicates a loss of pressure on the left main landing gear tyre. These indications are also sent to the flight control team in the mission control centre. Commander Husband and Pilot McCool call up the fault page for the messages and review the available information. As they do so, three further fault messages appear, indicating further loss of tyre pressure on the left main landing gear. The failure which Husband and McCool see is not unfamiliar to them, differing only slightly from one of their training exercises. One of the failure scenarios the crew practiced during training was a circuit breaker trip that resulted in one half of the tyre pressure sensors being disabled. A circuit breaker trip would disable some sensors for the tyres, but this failure involves all tyre pressure sensors on the left main gear only. The crew attempt to contact mission control at this point, but their message was not received, although it can be assumed the flight crew wish to discuss the tyre pressure warnings. 30 seconds after the first tyre pressure warning, another fault becomes evident. The position indicator for the left main landing gear changes from displaying a status of up to what is known as a barber pole, a series of red and white bars. This has been caused by the left landing gear lock, showing that the left gear is extended, while at the same time, the landing gear door is closed. The two events cannot both be true, so instead, an error is shown. We know this is due to damage to the wiring around the left landing gear, but the flight crew have no indication of this. They likely continued to troubleshoot the problems as connected to some sort of issue with the left main landing gear. At 8.59 and 29 seconds, as Columbia's left wing continues to deform, the orbiter's tendency to yaw and roll could no longer be countered by the elevon trim alone. With insufficient aerodynamic control authority to assist the elevons, Columbia's flight controls call on the orbiter's reaction control system. These small thrusters are designed for attitude adjustment and course correction and have been pulsing steadily throughout the shuttle's re-entry. Now, two of these thrusters begin firing continuously in an effort to keep the shuttle from yawing and rolling further to the left. However, to the flight crew, there was no obvious indication that this was taking place. Only a small light illuminates on the control panel. But the next warning will be impossible to ignore. The flight crew receive a response from Mission Control. And Columbia Houston, we see your tire pressure messages and we did not copy your last. Commander Husband begins to reply. Roger, uh, be- This is the last communication from Columbia. Telemetry data to the ground stops simultaneously. Suddenly, Columbia's master alarm begins sounding. This has been caused by the failure of one of the flight control system's four channels. For redundancy, the orbiter uses four channels to control and monitor the position of its flight surfaces. But as the left wing is steadily damaged, the sensors for the elevon position on flight channel 4 have failed. The flight control system automatically excludes this channel from control of the orbiter, but it has triggered the master alarm, warning the flight crew of the situation 
with yaw and roll continuing to develop, the orbiter's flight control system begins firing the final two reaction control thrusters to try and keep Columbia on course. At 8.59 and 37 seconds, the three redundant hydraulic systems of the orbiter, which have been exposed to intense heating in the left wing, completely fail. The control surfaces they are connected to are no longer responding to the flight control system and holding the orbiter on course. Instead, with no hydraulic pressure to hold them in place, they begin to float in the airstream, gradually drifting up. This causes Columbia to begin to pitch upwards. The flight control system has lost control of Columbia. Still banked to the left as part of her S-turn, as Columbia pitches up, she begins to expose more of her belly to the oncoming airstream causing the drag profile of the shuttle to build. A roll ref alarm sounds on the flight deck, warning the commander and pilot that this is occurring. For Commander Husband and Pilot McCool, the first strong indications of the loss of control would be lighting and horizon changes seen through the forward windows, and changes on the vehicle attitude displays. Chola and Clark seated behind the flight crew, may have also been aware of a problem. It is also likely that those in the mid-deck were aware of an issue, as mission specialist David Brown began to strap himself into his seat. Now, having pitched up, with its belly in the direction of travel, the orbiter starts a slow, flat spin, with its nose alternately pointing skywards and earthwards. This causes the astronauts to be pushed into their seats by the deceleration, while alternately swaying from side to side. The situation is deeply disorienting. One of the flight crew inadvertently bumps the rotational hand controller, which is the shuttle's flight stick, used to control its attitude. This is quickly corrected, and the digital autopilot is re-engaged. At the same time, The other flight crew member acknowledges the error messages appearing on the shuttle's screens. Pilot McCool, seeing that the orbiter has lost hydraulic pressure, believes that the APUs supplying that pressure may have failed. He begins taking steps to restart APUs 2 and 3 in an attempt to restore hydraulic power and bring the orbiter back under control. What he cannot know is that it's the hydraulic lines themselves which have failed, not the APUs. There is no chance of restoring hydraulic pressure. Columbia stays in this spin for 30 seconds. While the flight crew attempt to bring Columbia back under control, the forces acting on them and the orbiter have been steadily building. While the aerodynamic forces are within the structural limitations of the orbiter, There is another problem, the heat of re-entry. Areas of the shuttle with no thermal protection system are now being exposed to heat they were never designed to withstand as the shuttle spins. While the orbiter is in its flat spin, it is also rolling alternately from side to side, exposing the fragile sides of the orbiter to this superheated air. The first structure of Columbia to fail is her payload doors, steadily torn apart by the heat and aerodynamic forces the orbiter is experiencing. With the payload doors destroyed, the superheated air can now penetrate the vulnerable interior of the orbiter. The next weakest spot the air encounters is the starboard sill joint gusset, a structural component designed to transfer the weight of the crew module to the main body of the orbiter. As Columbia rolls alternately left and right, the gusset, which was never designed to withstand the temperature of re-entry, is gradually weakened. The combination of the increasing temperatures on the gusset and the aerodynamic forces destroys it. With this major load-bearing component of the shuttle's forebody destroyed, 
the weight of the crew module on the forebody of the orbiter transfers to Columbia's fragile skin. This skin begins unzipping from starboard to port, like a tin can being opened. With the forebody separating from the rest of the orbiter, all resources to the crew module from the midbody are lost, including power from the fuel cells. This results in the loss of all powered lighting, crew displays, radio, intercom, ventilation, and main oxygen supply. Very shortly afterwards, the crew module contained within the forebody, and no longer being supported from the midbody, strikes the bottom of the forebody it's contained within. This impact is sufficient to generate a small hole, about 11 inches in diameter, in the bottom of the crew module. At 181,000 feet, the estimated altitude of the breakup, depressurization of the module is rapid. The crew of STS-107 fall unconscious within a matter of seconds. The depressurization of the crew module is so quick that none of the crew even have time to lower the visors on their helmets. Mercifully, from this point onwards, the crew are totally unaware of their surroundings or the environment they are within. The entire forebody of Columbia falls to the left and down, hanging on the port side support briefly, before finally falling away from the rest of the orbiter. As the forebody and the crew module contained within it continue to spin, the unconscious astronauts are subjected to a variety of forces. The seatbelt tensioners on the shoulder harnesses, which should limit the astronauts' range of movement, do not lock. The seats do not conform to the body of the astronauts, leaving them free to move about. In addition, the helmets provide no cushioning to the astronauts' heads. This results in severe blunt force trauma to the astronauts as they are thrown around within their seats. Again, the astronauts are unconscious and unaware of this. As the rate of rotation of the crew module continues, it begins to break apart. The seats and the astronauts within them are torn from the structure. The remains of the astronauts and the orbiter Columbia falls to Earth in small parts. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board concluded that the physical cause of the loss of Columbia and its crew was a breach in the thermal protection system on the leading edge of the left wing. This was caused by a piece of insulating foam which separated from the left bipod ramp section of the external tank at 81.7 seconds after launch, and struck the wing in the vicinity of the lower half of reinforced carbon-carbon panel number 8. During re-entry, this breach in the thermal protection system allowed superheated air to penetrate through the leading edge insulation and progressively melt the aluminium structure of the left wing, resulting in a weakening of the structure until increasing aerodynamic forces caused loss of control, failure of the wing, and breakup of the orbiter. This breakup occurred in a flight regime in which, given the design of the orbiter, there was no possibility for the crew to survive. The organizational causes of the accident were rooted in the space shuttle program's history and culture, including the original compromises that were required to gain approval for the shuttle, subsequent years of resource constraints, fluctuating priorities, schedule pressures, mischaracterization of the shuttle as operational rather than developmental, and a lack of agreed national vision for human spaceflight. Cultural traits and organizational practices detrimental to safety were allowed to develop, including reliance on past success as a substitute for sound engineering practices, organizational barriers that prevented effective communication, 
lack of integrated management across the program elements, and the evolution of an informal chain of command and decision-making processes that operated outside the organization's rules. The board released a raft of recommendations, some of which it stated must be completed before the space shuttle returned to flight. Technical recommendations included eliminating foam shedding debris from the external tank, improving the orbiter's resistance to debris strikes, improving imaging capabilities of the shuttle during launch to better identify debris strikes, and undertaking inspections of the shuttle post-launch for debris damage. From an organizational perspective, the board's recommendations included adopting and maintaining a shuttle flight schedule that was consistent with available resources, training to help mission management team members better deal with scenarios such as the debris strike again, and similar to an independent safety authority had been established following the Challenger disaster, establish an independent technical engineering authority that would be responsible for technical requirements and all waivers to them. It is unsurprising that the space shuttle fleet was immediately grounded and the program paused following the loss of Columbia. The previously critical date of International Space Station U.S. Core Complete was forgotten. The space shuttle was the only vehicle capable of delivering the new components of the ISS. Resupply of the ISS crew would be undertaken by the unmanned and disposable Progress spacecraft. Crew transfer would be undertaken by the Russian Soyuz, which had first flown in 1966. In the meantime, NASA looked to implement the changes recommended by the Accident Investigation Board. It would be more than two years later, on the 26th of July 2005, that the space shuttle would launch again. STS-114 was the first return-to-flight mission for the program. Flown by the shuttle Discovery, the mission successfully delivered supplies to the International Space Station. However, one of its main objectives was to test the safety improvements made to the shuttle program following the loss of Columbia. Unfortunately, despite the redesign of the foam application to the external tank, foam was shed once again during launch. A piece of foam, approximately half the size of what had struck Columbia, was shed from the external tank, but thankfully did not strike the orbiter. Once the shuttle had rendezvoused with the ISS, three spacewalks were undertaken to demonstrate the ability of astronauts to successfully inspect and repair the shuttle in orbit. The crew also tested a remotely operated arm, which could be used to inspect the orbiter while on orbit, without having to undertake a spacewalk. But the loss of foam on launch would cause the shuttle fleet to be grounded for a further year. The second return-to-flight mission would launch as STS-121. With this mission considered a success in demonstrating the new safety measures implemented, the space shuttle could return to full service. But even before the space shuttle had returned to flight, its days were numbered. Almost a year to the day since Columbia's final launch, January 14, 2004, President George W. Bush announced the vision for space exploration. The vision called for the space program to complete the ISS by 2010 retire the space shuttle by 2010, develop a new crew exploration vehicle by 2008, and conduct its first human spaceflight mission by 2014. The vision would explore the moon with robotic space missions by 2008, with crewed missions to follow in 2020. Delays in the construction of the International Space Station led to the Space Shuttle's retirement being postponed until 2011, with Atlantis undertaking the final mission as STS-134 on July 21, 2011. The Space Shuttle 
is a contentious part of NASA's history, seen by some as a step backwards in NASA's goal of exploring space, or as a dangerous vehicle with a high failure rate. It also never achieved what it was designed to do, which was to make reaching low Earth orbit cheap and routine. Many of the tenets that justified the Space Shuttle's creation turned out to be faulty, such as the notion that a reusable vehicle could be cheaper when disposable supply craft were capable of resupplying the ISS, and single-use rockets could deploy satellites at a lower cost and much more safely. Nevertheless, the technical solution to the problem, which would become the Space Shuttle, is an engineering marvel. It is important to remember that when NASA first proposed the Space Shuttle, it was to be the foundation upon which the agency conceived the construction of space stations within low Earth orbit, permanent outposts on the Moon, and initial journeys to Mars. Now, nearly 50 years later, those visions appear to be becoming a reality. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket has demonstrated the capability of a reusable rocket system and SpaceX's Starship program could also pave the way for the first fully reusable spacecraft. In addition, NASA's Artemis program is dedicated to placing the first woman and the next man on the lunar surface with an established orbital outpost. Many of the components which made up the Space Shuttle will also fly once again as part of NASA's new Space Launch System, or SLS. The solid rocket boosters of the Space Launch System are enlarged versions of those which flew on the Space Shuttle. Most interestingly, the engines are the same RS-25 engines which the Space Shuttle used. Not merely the same design, but the actual engines which were used by Space Shuttles in orbit. In this way at least, the Space Shuttle will continue flying. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of Inside the Black Box. Once again, I am very, very grateful for your patience while I prepared this episode. Your support and encouragement is deeply valuable for me while I continue this project. Please continue to follow the podcast at ITBB Podcast. That's India Tango Bravo Bravo Podcast. There is a huge amount of media associated with this episode which I would like to share with you. Until the next time.